The people of the land have practiced extortion and committed robbery. They have oppressed the poor and the needy. They have extorted the sojourner without justice. And I sought for a man among them who should build up a wall and stand in the breach before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. And therefore I have poured out my indignation upon them, and I have consumed them with fire of my wrath, and I have turned their ways upon their head, declares the Lord God. The doctrinal term interposition essentially means to stand in the gap. And that's the famous passage from Ezekiel that I read to you. That the Lord is looking for people to stand in the gap. If you think about what, we're, what we see happening today, there's a lot, of, a lot of opinions and very strong opinions about how it's happening. Oh, oh, it's on purpose. Oh no, it's because they're incompetent. Oh, it's both. You can be both be an evil genius and an incompetent boob, apparently. <laughs> Have we ever considered, as God's church, that what we're seeing are the early signs of God's wrath? That we're seeing the turning over of people's minds to their sin so they can't think clearly? That we're seeing circumstances that look random, that may be ordained supernaturally? Because God's looking for someone to stand in the gap among his people and finding none? That's what tonight's about. Because if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and repent of their ways, then not, Lord, heal our nation. If my people, if, 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 then I will respond. And what's interesting about that is God always looks to his people to bring the answers to a lost world. All right, let's see if your uh, polling is working right now. Let's see the first question here. Would you describe yourself as more religious conservative or secular libertarian? Those should actually have letters. I'm sorry that you don't. A, whoops. There they are. If you uh, take your texting app, A, B, C, or D, which one do you identify more as? I think I know, but I always like to ask because we love to have all mixtures of audiences. You're going to see where this polling comes up later in some slides I'm going to show you from some experience that we've had and data that we've collected over time. Okay, we're going to move at a pretty good clip too. All right. Next question. What one word would you to describe, use to describe what it's like being a Christian today, trying to be salt and light in society? One word. Be honest. Couple rules I have. Number one, no Sunday school answers. Sunday school answers are what have gotten us into this problem in the first place. Anybody know what the Sunday school answers are? Jesus. God is in control. Give it up to God. You know what they all have in common? I want you to think about this today. Spiritual platitudes. They're spiritual sound bites that are meant to get you to accept a lower standard. Oh, it's just God's timing. That's why things couldn't work out. So, and they all have one thing in common. Sit down. Don't worry about it. Be passive. There's some truth. When you look around, what bothers you more? The committed, organized advance of the left or the lack of committed, organized, effective response from the right. These are the questions that I'm going across the state asking for the last three years. I'm going to patriot groups. I'm going to parent groups. 
I'm going to special interest groups. But you know what I've just been able to start doing? I've just been able to start going into churches to ask these questions. Because up until about eight months ago, no churches wanted to open their doors for this message that I'm going to say tonight. All right. Historically, 80-20. Same thing. You're right in line with all the parent patriot groups. All right, next question. Oh, let me tell you a little bit else. All right, who's, who are we at Kinetic Faith? Kinetic Faith is a professional services team for community organizing. That's it. Professional services for community organizing. I know community organizing has a lot of negative connotations, but you know what? There was a president that served from 2008 to 2016 that we dismissed as a community organizer, and he pretty much kicked our butts all over the United States with our values and what happened in society, didn't he? Community organizing has power and teeth to it. Because what we found was you didn't have to be an experienced politician, you just had to be really committed to your cause to bring about change. We defeat evil through teams in their, in their community being influential salt and light. We're gonna talk more about this. Influential, not imposing. We're accused of imposing, we're never meant to impose. We're meant to be salt and light. Salt does what? Light does what? Exposes and chases away darkness. Salt preserves, light chases away darkness. How are we doing? I'm gonna to suggest to you that your communities, any church's communities, where their geographical footprint is, what do I mean by geographical footprint? I don't mean where the pastor stands behind the pulpit. That's a pretty small geographical footprint. I mean where the members and the attendees of the congregation go out and have a critical mass in their community, that's your church's geographical footprint. And every church's best indicator of their influence, the salt and light, is their community's tolerance for evil. We're not talking about conversions to Christ, professions of faith, baptisms, memberships, Bible studies. We're talking about, are they willing to say no to the pornography in their children's library? Are they willing to say no sex trafficking will ever happen in this vicinity, and if it does, we'll root it out and get rid of it? Are they willing to say no county commissioner will turn a blind eye to election fraud? If the church of 1938 had been doing its job in, in Germany, Human beings would not have been loaded on the boxcars as if they were not human beings. Because if the church can't convince its community that these are human beings, then the church really isn't very effective as salt and light. Amen? Your community's tolerance for evil is the best barometer of whether you are effective salt and light, which is God's expectation. Salt and light is not an invitation, it's not an opportunity, it is literally an expectation of the living God. Because judgment begins with who? The house of God. All right. Uh, we work with a team of teams approach. I'm going to move quickly through this. Train, equip, and mobilize. We, 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 help, we have formal training. We provide templates, coaching, and technology. We stick around and help you see their project through to completion. We've helped all, all kinds of people do things. Uh, we use a personal coach analogy because we don't do it for you. We're here to train you to do it the body of Christ. And we are a not-for-profit LLC. We are not a 501C because we go where the 501Cs either can't go or won't go, and 50Cs can be going a lot further than they are. Trust me, we know this legally. History of our causes. Sorry I'm turning around here, but I'm used to having my computer in front of me, so I need to make sure this is changing. So history of our causes. We started with saving boys and girls' bathrooms in Lancaster County. They wanted to be destroyed. We then chased away and shut down drag queen story hours in public libraries. We helped businesses survive during COVID and helped churches open that would be willing to. We've exposed election fraud and vulnerabilities and submitted evidence. We've helped parents take back control of their school boards and we've helped stop government overreach. And we've done it all without elections and we've done it all without lawsuits. Because the teams that we're supporting our influential salt and light convincing their community to say no. And you can reach critical mass at that level. This is a very cornerstone slide that I want you to see. People are going outside the church for answers. 
Anybody banging down your church's door to know what to do about election fraud? Anybody banging down your church's door about what to do about their school board? No, not from what we're seeing. We're literally sending them somewhere else, folks. Here's where they're going. They're leaving and they're forming these parent and patriot organizations. We're going there and speaking and doing the same polling we're doing with you here. And then we're recruiting parents and patriots from those organizations to form what we call community action teams made up of six to eight adults that are willing to work and play well with others. And then we train them on how to become influential to get volunteers and make the case to their community to go up against what they're facing. Here's the catch though. We collect data everywhere we go. On these community action teams, 90% are Christians and 90% are women. And they're all asking the same question. Where's the church and where's the men? By the way, Proverbs 31, wife, that excellent wife, it's all about the wife, right? Except there's one verse that's really interesting. Her husband is known in the gates. You know what the gates were? That's where interposition took place. That's where the justice was served. Elections were held. Judicial decisions were made. Sixty-seven percent that are come from those parent and patriot groups identify as religious conservative Christians. Two out of three, and up where it's between sixty-seven percent and up to eighty percent. They're leaving their church to go find people of like-mindedness that want to fight. And they're mingling with the secular libertarians because they can find more fellowship there to get it done. And when I ask them, when you think about your church's population and how many people are around you that think like you do and that you've been able to influence and, and, and think about and you guys are willing to work together, what percentage of your population of your church do you make up? And they say, 5%. This is why Kinetic Faith Mission Field is the church. This should not be happening. I want people to be able to come to your congregation, to your pastors, to your leadership and find answers. I want you to be the leaders in your community that God called you to be the influential salt and light so that when people think about who's beating back the doors, they don't have to say a church in Loudoun County, Virginia, a state away. Maybe you have to say a county away until we can get your church there, but it shouldn't be that far away. Oh, and by the way, nothing against Loudoun County. The, the Calvary Chapel that's there, I attended Calvary Chapel, I love Calvary Chapels, but I was recently talking to someone who was at their leadership conference, and that pastor, Gary Hamrick, that everyone puts on a pedestal about Loudoun County's Calvary Chapel beating back the evil over there, he spoke at the conference, and I asked my friend, what was his blueprint? He goes, huh? I go, what was his blueprint? What did he bring there to teach others? Well, he didn't. Well, what did he talk about? He talked about how great the victory was. What did he say? He said, the Lord was with us. See me later, I can explain to you what happened in Loudoun County. I'm not saying their church was irrelevant. Their church was, the pump was primed with what those people had been taught, but they did not have an organized resistance. There was a series of factors that came together, but we all want to attribute it to this church that doesn't even have a blueprint to show us. To what degree do you agree with the following statement? As goes the church, so goes the world. By the way, you will have a chance to uh, get a copy of this tonight. We want you to have a copy, okay? Sorry, I'm a pacer. I think if somebody handcuffed me to a podium or a pulpit, I'd probably just drag it along with me. I also can't make a cup of coffee without a whiteboard. So. All right, next question. On a scale of one to 10, how equipped do you feel to lead change for conservative Judeo-Christian values and protect our liberties? Scale of one to 10, 10 being the highest. One is at the top, 10 is at the bottom if you can't see that. 
So it's A through J, J being the highest, A being the lowest. All right. You're going to need to be honest with me because if you're lying to me, you're going to regret it. When I do these with those parent patriot groups that are leaving their churches to go look for help, roughly 76% are five or less. Now I want you to remember your answer and ask, how long have you attended your church? Or how long have you attended church in your life? That's what this one is. How long have you attended church? Okay, just let me make an observation here. If you've been attending church a long time and you click five or less, I think there's a conversation you need to start having in your church. If you click more than five, I think you need to be part of leading that conversation in your church and helping people, taking some responsibility. It's fine if they told us the truth then, right? If you click seven or eight or nine or 10, you're on the hook to lead and to help others. What do you think holds the church, i.e. leaders and congregants, back from actively fighting evil in society on behalf of their neighbor? These are kind of an eye chart, so let me read them for you. <laughs> you can read this, by the way, you don't have to go to the DMV anymore. All right, so A, the church believes that today's evil is God's will and trying to stop it would be contrary to his will. B, the church doesn't want to be involved and or believes it shouldn't be involved. C, the church wants to be involved and believes it should be involved but doesn't know how to go about it effectively. Or D, the church believes it should be involved, it knows how to go about it effectively but doesn't have the resources to win. So A, don't go against God's will. B, we really just don't want to do it or don't think we should do it. C, we want to do it but we need help. Or D, we got this. Now, I'm not going to divulge any details, but this is where we start to take a fork in the road with the pastors that I speak to. And I'm going to point out a couple of contrasts that I want you guys to go back and have conversations with your leadership. This is one of them. Most pastors start to, de to, start to answer on that lower end, especially D, which always kind of amazes me. Because then when I ask them for specifics about what they're doing, I don't get a lot of specifics. But. When there's a gap between what the pew is saying and what the pulpit is saying, I encourage you to have a conversation. Because you're both going to be held accountable. And God's not going to accept this. All right, thank you. Hey, before, we go, we, uh, before we start questions, I'm just two, que two survey questions short of our data collection, so help me out here. Okay. Real quick observation here. 65% of you think that the church's position is that it's either contrary to God's will or doesn't want to be or shouldn't be involved. That's almost two out of three. Help us change that. Help us get into your church, get your message out to your fellow believers. That can change. That's a mindset that needs to change. I am encouraged by the 36% of you that believes that they want to do it, they just don't know how to go it effectively. That's why we exist. Okay? Nonprofit LLC, we don't charge for our services. We want to help you. Of course, we need the funding to keep it going, so please consider that if you can't be on the team, but we want to come and help you. All right, so. Pull out your phones. When it comes to helping others, I believe that most church leaders condition their congregants to do what? To take initiative to work with others cooperatively, to take initiative to work independently, to wait and respond to the direction of leaders, to depend on leaders to do things on their behalf, or to do nothing at all. Pull out your phones and give us an answer. Just one, one question after this, and then we'll get to Q&A. I'm pretty encouraged by that. That's the highest I've ever seen in a church group for the A and B, honestly. Yeah. I'm not saying you're wrong, I'm just grateful to see it. Just clarify. Because I was at the room yesterday, yep. you know, the path of leaders and things. I think it's, it's a different sort of response about what I think it should be versus what I think the church at large in America is yeah. thinking and doing. So there may be a disconnect there in the way the question is asked. 
that's fine. Well, I went, but it's perception. I went, I went, what's the perception that people have? Well, that's the, the reason I ask the way I ask it is because it's the congressman question. What do you think of Congress? Congress sucks. What do you think of my congressman? Oh, he's the best one. Nothing wrong with my congressman. My congressman's good. See, everybody else is congressman. That's why we ask. It's a Congress question. Okay, last question, but good point. Fair point. In terms of where you find hope for positive change, in which institutions do you place your most confidence? Now, by the way, before you answer this question, if you say churches, you're on the hook to help me out make that a reality. If you say no institutions, fine. Just don't say no institutions because I believe it's Jesus. That's a Sunday school answer. God works through human institutions. All right. I've got a lot of people signing up here. Okay, and let's see. So real quick, I'm not going to go through this except to say, I'm going to send you these slides if you want to sign up for them, we're going to give you an opportunity. Basically, long story short, we are trying to get across the state with a series of conferences in churches this year to go after abortion. I share Matthew Trella's viewpoint that we shouldn't have to wait for Roe v. Wade, but I'm going to tell you what, they overturn, overturn Roe v. Wade, we are completely without excuse as the body of Christ. We're still without excuse right now. But help us out. We'll learn more. We want to get across the state with a series of conferences. We want to get into the churches. We want to get into the men's groups. What were the two questions my team's always asked? Where's the church? Where's the men? I want to get into men's groups and have men's groups become the base camps for our community action teams. And yes, legally, it can't be done. This is the three people we're looking for. Fighters are in the trenches on the teams. Sponsors are the people that can't be in the trenches, but they can help financially support the fighters. And advocates help us find more fighters and, and sponsors. If you're living your faith kinetically, we believe you're in one of these three quadrants, one of these three uh, circles. You could be in more than one. That's awesome. All right, I'll skip through this. Basically, this talks about the mindset and, the, and, the, and what we have, mindset, skill set. And they're counting on us not to have these things, but kinetic faith is the antithesis of all this. You can see that if you get the deck. Good evening, everybody. I think I've made it to the city of God. <laughs> it's good to be here. I can tell you Philadelphia is not the city of God. <laughs> so we have um, free things that are available on our table in the back, or down below, I should say. And one you need to get is to make sure you get my sermon to the Montana legislature. It was a sermon, an election sermon that I preached in January of 2015 on the doctrine of the lesser magistrate. They're the only state that still does election sermons. Preached it right in the rotunda at the Capitol in Helena. It's very good and it often gets the magistrates and the churchmen willing to read the book and to learn more about this doctrine. Um, we also have bumper stickers, literature. We also have this book by Pierre Veret. Veret, well, of course, was part of the triumvirate with Calvin and Farrell. Uh, it's a phenomenal work. So these are timeless truths about the Christian and the magistrate from 500 years ago. And there's also this documentary that's available. The book's 10 bucks. The documentary's 10 bucks. It's a DVD. And it's three hours long. It was put together by Chris Pinto. And it is probably the best history on Christianity in America I've ever seen in my life. And um, I study history all the time. And that work he put together is phenomenal. So we have um, this little card on the table also. And uh, it has a website on it called howjesuschangedmylife.com. Before I knew Christ, I was in a gang raised on the east side of Detroit, so I used to steal cars, burn down houses, fight other gangs, rob people, deal drugs, and other nefarious things. I was put into teen challenge by the courts when I was 17 years old, tried as an adult on an arson charge, and the courts put me into teen challenge, and Christ radically changed my life. We do tons of ministry out on the streets and at the university. I've shared my testimony thousands of times. Finally, four years ago, wrote it down. 
had to leave a lot out because it could be too long. It is 25 pages. So if you go to howtojesuschangemylife.com, you can read about what the Lord did in my life. And by the way, when I thought about howjesuschangedmylife.com, I thought for sure that one would already be taken. But it wasn't. $2.99. When we got to fightyrants.com, we had to get it because we were lessermagistrate.com and I was doing lots of interviews and everybody's like, what did you say? How do you spell that? So we changed it to fightyrants.com. No one's ever asked me since we changed how to spell or what did you say? And... Um, I thought for sure, given the state of our nation, it would be taken, right? Nope, $2.99, defytyrants.com. So, family is really big. To me and my wife, Clara, we've been married for 40 years. This is our deck this past Christmas. There's like eight or nine people who are part of our family that aren't there. Me and Clara have 11 children. We have six daughters and five sons. Six of them are married so far, and we have 27 grandchildren at this time. So the Lord has blessed us mightily. And so if you could bear with me just for a moment, I want to just give you an exhortation about family. Because my heart breaks when I see what's happening to families, and it's been done by government design. I've been working on a book for a while to show the decimation of family from a government perspective how it's been done by design through policy and law, how they've made boilerplate feministic thinking public policy in our nation, and it's decimated the family. And the reason the status have made all these changes regarding family and how it functions in regards to the state is because every good status knows that in order to strengthen the state, you have to weaken the family. Very important to know. I know America, most people don't read anymore, but you must read this book, Family and Civilization by Carl Zimmerman. It is a phenomenal work written in 1947. Zimmerman was not a Christian. He was a sociologist, but he was an honest man. If you know anything about sociology, it does one of two things with Christianity. It either acts like it didn't have Christianity didn't have anything to do with Western civilization for the last 2,000 years, or it had everything bad to do with Western civilization for the last 2,000 years. Zimmerman was simply an honest man, and he shows much of the good that Christianity brought to Western civilization. His colleagues hated him for it, but they couldn't debunk him because his credentials were impeccable. And in 1947, in this work, he predicted that America would soon see Divorce for any reason or no reason at all, happened in the late 60s, early 70s, no fault divorce, that we would soon see legalized abortion, 1973, and that we would soon see rampant homosex throughout the culture. He said that in 47. People thought he was crazy. He based his prediction upon his studies of the French and Bolshevik revolutions, but more importantly, upon the Greek and Roman civilizations and other smaller people groups and societies. And he said the reason he was making his prediction, he said, is because the tipping point when any culture begins its slide into decadence, immorality, and destruction is when the people no longer want to have children. And he said, I don't mean by that zero. He said, although there are those. He said, what I mean by that is they only want one or two. And he showed from the time the Greeks didn't want to have children until they fell to the Romans was about 150 years. And the time from when the Romans didn't want to have children till they finally fell completely to the Germanic hordes was nearly 400 years. America has been in a deep decline for over 150 years. The last six years, we don't even replace ourselves demographically. Demographers say you need 2.1 children per couple just to replace yourself. Last year, we were 1.69. Western Europe, Christian Western Europe, far worse, 1.24, 1.29, 1.28. We are committing familial suicide in our nation and throughout Western civilization. What the Muslims weren't able to do through the sword, they're now able to do simply through following the created order of God and having children. Zimmerman said the reason that's the tipping point when people no longer want to have children, he said, is because when men 
want to be husbands and fathers, and women want to be wives and mothers, it produces within people virtue. But when men don't want to be husbands and fathers, and women don't want to be wives and mothers, it produces within people vice. And he says the whole thing eats on itself, and when it collapses, the collapse is so sudden, it astounds everyone. And from my perception of things and the reading of history, I think we're in the midst of that collapse. People who used to think I was an extremist 20 years ago and what I was talking about now call me to try and alarm me <laughs> what they see. The collapse is so rapid and it's widespread. So I say all that to say, hold your spouse dear. Men, hold your wife dear. Wives, hold your husbands dear. Put the time into your children. Build your family. Do all that you can not to conform to Americanism. Do right by him, raise your homes, govern your homes properly. Put the time into it. You don't get to be like most American men in their self-absorption. You actually have to put time into your wife, into your children, building something good and strong. And there's a million things I could say about that, but I just wanted to start with encouraging you in that regard. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we have the time to talk about this important matter of the Lesser Magistrate Doctrine. I pray you put a fire within the hearts of your people regarding this matter as they see that this goodness is from you, that you do speak to all matters of life, including civil government matters. And Lord, that we would live faithful and true to you in all areas of our life and in all areas of life. And we ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This thing isn't working. I thought the book was up there all that time. I'm sorry. Okay, there's the book. Just so you know, when you go to Amazon to order it, right? Don't go to Amazon. Okay. So, there we go. All right. So, the Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrate, I just want to give a brief perusal of what it is. You have the book. You can learn all about it yourself. And then I want to get to some nuts and bolts and speak to you specifically about some important matters regarding the doctrine in our time and in our day. So the doctrine is simply this, that when the higher ranking civil authority makes unjust or immoral law, policy, or court opinion, the lower or lesser ranking civil authority has both the God-given right and duty not to obey, and if necessary, to actively resist the superior authority. So you have that, right? The superior authority acts lawlessly or immorally or unjustly, the duty of the lesser authorities is not blithe compliance, it's rather interposition. They're to stand between, use their lawful office to stand between the tyrant superior authority and those they aim to oppress. Massively important. I use this quote from uh, Emperor Trajan. He was giving a sword to one of his subordinates and um, upon giving the sword to his subordinate, I don't know why this isn't working. Um, maybe you can ask Rick if he can change it out with his thing, because mine, oh, there it goes. So I'll stand down here. The tech lady's going to kill me, but that's okay. So here's the deal. He gave his sword to his subordinate, and he simply said, use this sword against my enemies if I give righteous commands. But if I give unrighteous commands, use it against me. That's the doctrine in a nutshell. When the superior authority does wrong, the duty of the lesser authorities is to stand in interposition in defiance of the evil that he wants to do. Um, the doctrine was first formalized by Christian men in um, Magdeburg, Germany. So, wow. Does anybody know where Rick went? Because we can change his thing out with my thing, and I can just use yours, because yours seem to be working fine from up here. And mine's not. And then I can go back up and she'll be happy. You got it? Awesome. So I'm going to have to buy Rick's clicking thing. The donation doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. There you go. It was first formalized in 1550 in the Magdeburg Confession, which you just got. 
It's a phenomenal story, phenomenal work, phenomenal work. It's the story of the city that saved the Reformation. It's the story of a city that defied an empire and won. It's a story of Christian men who put Christian thought to bear upon civil government matters. After Luther had died in 1546, the Holy Roman Emperor tried to re-Romanize all the Protestant lands under Roman Catholic rule, practice, and faith. Only one city defied, it was Magdeburg. If it had not been for the interposition of that one city, which suffered a 13-month siege because of their stand and fealty to Christ, which they won, 4,000 of Charles's men were killed, 468 Magdeburgers died. If it had not been for that one lone city, the Reformation may have been just a blip on the radar screen of human history. That's how important their interposition was. John Knox wrote the foremost treatise on the doctrine of the lesser magistrate in his appellation to the nobles of Scotland, which was written in 1558. And he cited over 70 passages of scripture to so show that the doctrine is sound in the word of God. And you can still read it today. Now the doctrine is rooted in the historic Christian doctrine of interposition. Interposition is where you stand in the gap. Rick read the verse out of Ezekiel chapter 22. Understand there's many accounts of interposition within the scripture. Remember the Hebrew midwives were told to kill the male Hebrew children. Instead of doing so, they interposed to keep them alive. Remember Saul's foolish edict? Jonathan started a fight with the Philistines. Saul got involved. He put out a decree. Everyone has to not eat anything to the battle's over. Jonathan didn't hear. He ate some honey. Saul was going to kill Jonathan. And it says that the people intervened on his behalf and declared not one hair should touch them. Not one hair on the head of him who brought Israel such a great victory today shall be touched. They interpose. When it comes to the interposition of the lesser authority, he interposes between the superior tyrant authority and those he aims to oppress. And understand, their interposition is so needed, it can actually abate the just judgment of God. In Ezekiel chapter 22, it talks about how God looked for a man to stand in the gap to build a wall because of the evil in the land. He could not find one. And so he said, therefore, I'm bringing my judgment upon the land. The interposition of the lesser authorities can actually abate the judgment, just judgment of God. And understand this also, their interposition keeps the evil of the superior authority from getting down into the fabric of society. The superior tyrant authority always counts upon the blithe compliance of the lesser authorities in order to get their evil down in the fabric of society. And when they don't have that blithe compliance, that's when they know they have a problem on their hand. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a moment. So this is about the fact that whether you read John of Salisbury in the 12th century, Alfred the Great in the 9th century, or this guy, William Blackstone in the 18th century, the most cited legal scholar by America's founders, they all taught, Western man taught for over 1,500 years that God's law was the objective standard to which all men and all governments of men were accountable. It wasn't political theory, it was political fact. And he made clear, Blackstone did, that any law made contrary to God's law is no law at all and should not be suffered amongst us. He made clear he was talking about the law of God found only in the Holy Scriptures. James Wilson, who was placed on the original Supreme Court by George Washington himself also talked about the law of God being the objective standard to which all men and all governments of men were accountable. And John Salisbury talked about the interposition of the lesser magistrates when he said this, loyal shoulders should sustain the power of the ruler so long as it's exercised in subjection to God and follows his ordinances, but if it resists and opposes the divine commandments, and wishes to make me share in its war against God, then with unrestrained voice I answer back that God must be preferred before any man on earth. John of Salisbury wrote that in 1159 AD. All of my children, we homeschooled them. All of them had to read Polycraticus when they were 14 or 15 years old. It's a powerful work. 
So the first standard of when the lesser authorities have to intervene, when the superior authority does wrong, is when they impugn the law or word of God. The standard that Christian men have always followed is if the state commands that which God forbids or forbids that which God commands, we are to obey God rather than man. We are to obey God rather than the state. And this quote here from Alice um, Baldwin in the New England Clergy and American Revolution from 1928, another must-read book, says it was not left to rulers to be oppressive and arbitrary. God, from whom their power ultimately was derived, had limited that power. The power that the civil authority possesses is delegated power. Therefore, they have a duty to govern according to his rule. If they abuse their power, abuse their authority, they must be resisted. The abuse of their authority must be taken to task. So if they make law, policy, or court opinion contrary to the law or word of God, they are to be resisted by the lesser authorities. And also, if they exceed the limits of their authority, they are to be resisted. God limits the authority of the civil magistrate, both in his word, the Bible, and also, since we live in America, it's limited by the Constitution and by the state constitutions of the various states. A churchman said to me, he said this, if the governor tells me to put pinwheels on my head in order to go into the grocery store, we put pinwheels on our heads to go into the grocery store. He was using that in relationship to putting a mask on. And he's wrong. They've exceeded the authority. They've exceeded the limits of their authority at that point, and they must not be obeyed. Now, there's certain things we forbear about, but there's certain things you must not forbear about. When it came to the mask, a lot of people thought the mask, big deal, it's a mask. I'll just wear it. No, I never wore it once during the entire time. And the reason I didn't is because I saw it for the evil that it was. It wasn't just a mask. It was an act tied to a massive evil narrative in order to strengthen the hands of tyrants within our civil government. And so therefore, I resisted and refused to put a mask on. There's many things that Matt Truella would like to change in the world. He's pretty powerless to change most of them. But what goes on my face is something I can control. All the time I went without a mask, I was only thrown out of four stores. I was only approached, if I remember right, twice with someone saying something to me. And I was always the only one without a mask. That went on for well over a year, nearly a year and a half. Everyone wearing a mask. The last store I was thrown out was a year ago at this time in Best Buy. I walked in with my 15-year-old daughter. There were two young men there. And they said, oh, sir, you have to have a mask in order to shop here. And I looked at him and I said, well, we don't wear masks. And he said, oh, we have just the thing for you. And he pointed down to a card table. And there were a bunch of face shields. So I looked at that, and I looked up at the young guy, and I said, if you think I'm going to put that on my face and walk around your store like Jojo the circus monkey, I said, you're living in a fantasy land. And the look on his face was priceless. And we ended up having a five-minute conversation, which ended with me saying, make sure you tell your manager, Matt Truella will never shop in this store ever again. Not just when you stop your dopey masking thing, ever. I will never shop here again. You have to take stands like that because you have to understand that tyranny is built plank by plank. I like to use the example of the Jews because it's so well known in our society. The Jews weren't just called one day down to the railroad stations and told to hop on the boxcars. Everything started eight years earlier. The first law being they couldn't sit on a public park bench. And the Jews thought, well, it's just a public park bench. And they accommodated themselves. 
And then it was another law. They couldn't attend theater. And they accommodated themselves to that. And it just got worse and worse because they kept accommodating themselves to the evil that was being done. And the longer you accommodate them, yourself to them, the stronger their tyranny becomes and the harder it is to undo it. When you see the evil, you must immediately take it to task. And that's why it's important to do that. How many people thought, well, if I get the mask, then we're good, right? Nope. Then they want everybody to get the shot. They use the carrot first, got a bunch of people, didn't get enough of them, now we use coercion. The carrot wasn't good enough, now we use coercion. We use the businesses in order to get this accomplished. And you have to understand how pernicious this evil is that we're up against. And they're not going away. They're busy building all their infrastructure to bring down the hammer stronger next time. That's how tyrants work. They squeeze, and then they let go. They squeeze, and then they let go. So then everybody was like, well, let's accommodate ourselves and just get the shot, then we don't have to wear the mask. You know how many people I met who said that? Yeah. And then they found out, well, I did get the shot, and they still tell me I have to wear the mask. You can't appease tyrants. You have to confront them. You have to defeat them. And when it comes to this doctrine of the lesser magistrate, it's part of how tyrants are defeated. You must stand against them privately. Understand me, you must. No one's around, it's just you and your boss, it's just you and the person at the business, wherever you may be. The government officials say you can't come to a public meeting as a taxpayer because you don't have a mask on? Right. You must take a stand. I found it interesting when I flew out here, it had been 27 months since I'd been on a plane. This is my first flight in 27 months to come and see all of you. And the day we left, Biden goes to a federal judge to try to get him to reimpose the masking for all flying. I told my wife, Claire, I said, it may be in the providence of God that the Chuelas get to defy the entire federal government <laughs> just trying to go home to Milwaukee. So we'll let you know how that goes. <laughs> so it's extremely important that you resist on a personal level, but it's also important that you resist on a public level. Join with others and your lesser authorities. What did we see through all this thing? Here's what a lot of people have realized. They realize not only is Washington, D.C. at war with them, but they also realize their state officials aren't going to protect them. In fact, they learn their state officials love to play the tyrant themselves. They also learn that there's plenty of local tyrants at county boards, sheriffs, mayors, common councils. But what I find interesting about all that went on, and almost all was with Blythe compliance, we did document over 500 acts of interposition mostly by county and local officials, almost exclusively by county and local officials. And because of that, we've seen people rush in to county and local government to make a stand for freedom. I view that as a goodness. I've been telling people for years, get off the hamster wheel where you just look who's gonna be president every four years and who's gonna put in the Supreme Court justices, get involved in state, county, and local government matters. That's more important. No one would listen. Now they listen. Now people are flooding into there. And I could tell you a million great stories of what people have done in changing the complexion of school boards and county boards in our state. Now this is important here. I'm going to pass all this up. You can read about all that later. Yeah, all that too, all that. Even that. And I'm going to go to this. Because I want to share with you just two examples of interposition by county officials. Remember two years ago when those governors were coming out like every 72 hours with some new draconian order? Like they were some emperor? Right, you guys have a psycho here. Your governor, Governor Wolf. Well, something happening? We're being, we're being bombed or something like that? What is it? 
Oh, Amber Alert. Okay. This is the state of Illinois, which is right below where I live in Wisconsin. Their governor is J.B. Pritzker. J.B. Pritzker loves to play the tyrant. In fact, his goal he's working on right now is to be the first state in America that has vaccine passports statewide. Do you know that already 27 states have put everything in place to have vaccine passports? They have changed the name from vaccine passports, but if you look at what they are, they're vaccine passports. Only dopes don't realize they are just because they changed the name. They hoodwink some of the dopes. But it's the same thing. It's voluntary now, they say. It's voluntary. Yeah, it's voluntary now until it's not voluntary. They're putting all the infrastructure in place. Well, in May of 2020, Governor Pritzker came out with his latest draconian decree, and it was this. He said, no businessman can open their business till I say you can open your business. And he said, now if any businessman opens their business before I say you can open your business, you will now be arrested and charged with a crime. And the very next day, in a state of 102 counties, only one county brought their board together, and that was Madison County, which sits right on the Mississippi River, directly across from St. Louis. And they put out their own decree in response to Governor Pritzker. And their decree declared that their businessmen are free to reopen now, and that they would use all their power and their authority to protect their businessmen, and then they cautioned the governor and the state not to interfere with their businessmen. Well, Governor Pritzker responded in good tyrant fashion, and the next day he held a press conference where he threatened to remove their federal money, their state money, and he had a whole list of bad things he would do to Madison County if they didn't get with the program. In fact, he did that for the next three days. But the men of Madison County held firm. They were resolute. They did not waver. And then seven days after Governor Pritzker had come out with his decree, the Illinois State Police put out a press release stating that they would not arrest any businessman anywhere in the state who opened their business before Governor Pritzker said they could. They had decided to stand with the men of Madison County. And the very next day after that, Governor Pritzker rescinded his order. That's exactly how the doctrine of the lesser magistrate is supposed to work. And understand, if it had not been for the interposition of that one lone county, just like the Magdeburgers of old dealing with the Reformation, the entire state of Illinois would have remained under that draconian decree. And know this also, the man who heads up Madison County is a Christian brother, and he had read my book two years earlier. And he had taught the doctrine to the men of that county, and they knew exactly what their duty was in the face of that kind of tyranny. That is the interposition of the lesser magistrate. That is the doctrine of the lesser magistrate demonstrated. I'll give you one other example, and this has to do with a little county called Newton County, Missouri, which is way down in southwestern Missouri. And this is important to now. Because have you noticed the drum beats going once again to disarm us all? To infringe upon our Second Amendment rights? Well, remember when Biden first got in a little over a year ago? January and then February of last year? He was threatening to infringe upon the Second Amendment rights of us through executive order and trying to get Congress to make laws against our Second Amendment rights also. Little Newton County brought their board together and they wrote an ordinance in defiance of Biden and the federal government's lawlessness. And the first part of their three-part ordinance declares that any law or policy that infringes upon the Second Amendment rights of our citizens in Newton County is null, void, and of no authority in Newton County. Now I skipped over some slides there. When the first time took place in 1798, only took 11 years after the ink had dried on the Constitution, for the federal government to exceed the limits of the small defined authorities they were given within the Constitution, 
Two states immediately defied them. One state was Virginia and the other Kentucky. And James Madison, who was who? The architect of the US Constitution wrote the resolution in defiance of the federal government. And he said that the states had the duty to interpose to stop the evil that was being done. Thomas Jefferson wrote the Kentucky Resolution and he ended it with those very same words, that what they had done was null, void, and of no authority in the state of Kentucky because they had exceeded the limits of their constitutional authority. Here these guys are, how many years later? Yeah, long time ago, 200 and some years later, using those very same words regarding their ordinance. The second part of their ordinance declares that any county official who joins with any federal or state officials to infringe upon the Second Amendment rights of their citizens shall immediately be removed from office. And the third part of their ordinance instructs their sheriff to arrest any federal agents or otherwise who come into their county to try and infringe upon the Second Amendment rights of their citizens. As you can imagine, the media went psycho. Now, nobody would have ever known about what little Newton County did, except the media made it a national story. And often, what they mean for evil, I've seen God use for good. And because it became a national story, there are now dozens and dozens of counties around America that have the exact same ordinance in place. This is the inner position of the lesser authorities. And it's needed and necessary in our day. And Pastor Matt asked me to talk a little bit about what are the issues. And I want to talk about that a little bit, if I could, to you. And then I want to talk about judicial supremacy, because it is the number one reason the lesser authorities won't interpose. <laughs> Now understand, there were hundreds of examples of interposition, right, at the county and local level, at least that we found. A lot of them were tepid and weak, however. They didn't go along with the stuff, but they told everybody, but you should wear a mask and you should get vaccinated. We're just not going to enforce it. No, it's all a lie. You know, my county that I live in, which is Washington County, Wisconsin, they had me come in and teach the doctrine of the lesser magistrate three years before the pandemic came. They had the county board there. They had the sheriff there. They had state representatives there. And they invited the public in. There were 60 some people in all. And I taught them the doctrine. Our county was the only county out of 72 counties that defied our psychopath governor, Tony Evers. They issued three resolutions, the first two in open defiance of Evers, only six weeks in was their first declaration that they would follow nothing he was saying in Washington County. The third and last one they did, which was in late August, they chided their fellow Republicans at the state government level for not doing their duty and checking the governor and the evil that he was doing. So understand, this was good, right? But here was a problem that brought me at loggerheads with them. They kept taking the money. They pulled this whole pandemic thing off with two mountains, a mountain of lies and a mountain of money. And everybody loved the money. You know the churchmen loved the money, right? They closed their churches, 95% of them closed down their churches. So they played the traitor against Christ. But they didn't just play the traitor, they also played the prostitute. Over $12 billion has gone to Christian churches. Thousands of them took the money and Christian organizations. They were actually rewarded by the tyrants for shutting down and then when they reopened, teaching all their people to put on the mask, stay six feet apart, and put slimy stuff on their fingers. They were taught all this by the Christian legal organizations. Yeah, all the ones you know of. All were writing to us as pastors. You got free money coming to you, two and a half times whatever the income of your church is you now can get. From the federal government, you'll never have to pay it back. You see what's happening here? The federal government declared the churches unessential, and the churchmen affirmed the church is unessential. 
The history of Christianity has been where the churchmen have actually stood in the doors to keep the state out. Our churchmen are such whores that when the state blocks the door to keep them out, they stay out and they say, hey, can you grease our palm? I've never seen so many people leave their churches as through this. For many of them, it was their final straw. They had already seen the state of their church, the state of Christianity, and this was the straw that broke the camel's back. I estimate that 15 to 20 percent left their churches. Some have found other churches. There's a large group that goes nowhere now. Our church went from 140 people. We now have over 300 just because we remained open and stayed faithful to Christ. We had people visiting our church. We're in Wisconsin. We had people from Kentucky, Minnesota, Michigan, Iowa, Illinois, Ohio, almost every week, different people coming. I didn't get to talk to all of them. Literally hundreds came through. I didn't get to talk to all of them, but the ones I did talk to, at some point, they would stand there and look at the room full of people, and they would say, either with tears welling up in their eyes or actually rolling down their cheeks, they would say, you have no idea how good it is to be with the saints of God. That's when I realized how important it was that we do what we do and we remain faithful to him. Amen? Amen. So anyway, Newton County passes this ordinance, and now I was over here talking about these different issues. And when it comes to the different issues, here's the deal. You could put a blindfold on right now and throw a dart and hit it because everything's collapsing everywhere and there's so many different areas that need and demand interposition. For example, those who love medical freedom and understand the importance of that, that the government can't tell us what to put in our bodies or force in our children's bodies, they have bought my book by the thousands and thousands. The book has sold over a, nearly 100,000 copies now. So those who understand the importance of that have been buying the book and pushing for interposition by their lesser authorities. Those who are hold dear the Second Amendment, they've been buying the book. And they've been pushing their lesser authorities for interposition. The matter of homosex, it is the biggest thing at the school boards, ask Rick. The biggest thing. They all are interested in the doctrine of interposition. Those who have been fighting CPS and how they just willy-nilly seize children, they've been learning about interposition. The military, they've been learning about interposition, and this has been a recent thing just over the last eight months where it's come to my attention, where the military men who have been standing for those few who refuse to get the vaccine have learned about the doctrine and are telling everyone about it. General Mike Flynn tells everybody he speaks to, and he speaks often, all about my book. He says it is the number one book you need to read because this has to happen or America's done. I just talked to another lieutenant colonel in the Air Force who just retired this last week. We talked Wednesday, the day I was flying out here. He had retired the day before. He learned about my doctrine, pardon me, he learned about the doctrine and learned about my book three months ago. And he's been telling everyone about it everywhere he goes. So the military men are now learning about the importance of the doctrine of interposition. And if you know anything about the history of man, the military often plays an important role of interposition when civil governments begin to behave lawlessly. And of course, those who love the preborn and want to see the butchery ended of their slaughter, they love the doctrine of the lesser magistrate and have been involved for years already, trying to get states to do their duty and interpose against the evil being done to the preborn. In fact, over the last six years, 14 states have introduced what's known as bills of abolition, of abortion, which declare abortion to be murder. There's no exception. There's equity. It's treated as murder, 
and it openly defies the federal judiciary. Every one of those bills has been killed by the GOP machinery, the GOP leadership, and the pro-life, pro-family groups. The pro-abortion groups haven't even had to step up to the plate. Now we don't know what's going to happen with the Supreme Court because of the leak. We'll see what happens soon enough. But it is a crime that our magistrates in the church stood by for 49 years obeying SCOTUS when it comes to murder. And now people are going to see what the Republican representatives and governors are really like as they make laws or don't make laws to protect the preborn. Because you're going to see that most of them won't do it, and those who do do it will say, these people, these people, and these people can still be killed through abortion. That's what you'll see. Just two weeks ago, the state of Louisiana tried to make a bill of abolition get through. It did not did not make it in Louisiana. And that was with them knowing that Roe is likely to go down by the Supreme Court when it's released later this month. Two men that I'm friends with in Indiana, both state legislatures in the Indiana government, the one has introduced a bill of abolition five years in a row, killed every year. Finally, this other brother came on so now you have two people, they could at least have it in committee. They put it in the worst committee, of course, was killed in committee. Those two brothers made sure that for every bill that came before their state legislature, they had to take a roll call vote. Understand the legislators like to hide behind voice votes because they can tell you what that you want to hear and not tell you the truth about how they really voted. Because of their stand that way, and by the way, constitutional carry was one of three bills they passed which wouldn't have passed had there not been a roll call vote. You have to understand the Republicans are not your friends. The vast majority of them are not your friends. And I learned long ago they would much rather have a Democrat in office than a truly Christian man. And for these two Christian men, the GOP machinery in Indiana spent $1 million to primary them, to unseat them. Understand that a legislator in the state of Indiana spends about $35,000 to $40,000. They spent a million, and last month they were both defeated in the primary and are now out of office. That's what you got from the Republican Party. Hence Rick's question. Is it the left you're more concerned about or the right that's supposed to be on our side? I notice that 80% of you already understand what's going on there. And it's bad. So here's the deal. Let me do two quick things and then I'll be done. The first is this. Go to your county officials. Go to your common council and ask them to present one of four resolutions. One is a constitutional county. I'll use the counties for example. Tell them you want a resolution passed that we are a constitutional county. What that means is if any government official or any government entity impugns the constitution, whatever they have done is null void and of no authority in that county. Secondly, you don't have to do all four, just do one of the four. You can do a second amendment ordinance or resolution like Newton County did. Three, you could do a medical freedom resolution. No vaccine mandates in our state. Uh, pardon me, in our county. And whether by government or by business. The businesses need to be reined in by our magistrates. A lot of people hide behind this argument that they're a private business, they can do whatever they want. Do you live in America? Any businessman knows their business ain't private. There's so much regulation, policy, and law. As soon as you put your shingle out, you don't own it. You're just running it for the government. You spend hours every year as their agent sending them money. There is no private business. And when they do evil, 
trying to tell you, you have to put something in your body or put something on your face. You need to stand against that, and the magistrates need to make law against it because they're impugning freedoms that we have from men who fought, bled, and died for us to possess. And we have no right to just throw them on the ground and trample them under our feet. No right whatsoever. A fourth thing you can do is ask that you bring a resolution that the county be declared a sanctuary county for the preborn. Once you do any one of these four, you'll know exactly who's sitting up there. Politicians will pay you lip service all day and tell you what you want to hear. These things put rubber to the road where they have to reveal their hearts. Understand? If they don't support any one of those resolutions, now you know who you need to unseat. Understand? Extremely important. As you may have noticed, by the way, the Republicans and Democrats, the conservative talking heads and the liberal talking heads continue on with their same old status quo, acting like nothing really bad's going on in our country. And the Republicans are just all following their usual status quo. Let me tell you something, a linear response in the face of an existential threat will not work. And we bring from the word of God, we bring Christian thought to bear upon the situation for a remedy to rein in the evil that's being done by the civil authorities. So that's the first thing I want to tell you is about those resolutions. And here's the last thing, and it's this. You must be able to dismantle the fiction of judicial supremacy, and I want to do that with you here now. It'll take me about 12 minutes. The reason you have to be able to dismantle judicial supremacy is because the politicians love to hide behind it. And they'll tell you, oh, I'm against the murder of the preborn. I'm against sodomite marriage. But the Supreme Court has ruled all we can do is obey. And it's a lie. And I want to show you that it's a lie. So judicial supremacy is founded upon three great fictions, the first of which is the idea that when SCOTUS issues an opinion, it's the law of the land. And that's not true. In fact, Article 1, Section 1 of our US Constitution, right at the beginning, declares that all lawmaking power shall reside with Congress, which consists of a Senate and a House. Now, I was one of those guys who got A's in every subject except math. I got D's. And when they brought letters in, I was completely confused. How did letters get in math? But even I understand that if all lawmaking power resides with Congress, the legislative branch, how much does that leave the judiciary? Zero. Correct? None. And that's why Justice Scalia said this after the Obergefell opinion. He said, Obergefell, of course, you know, is where they said two men or two women can marry, is a naked judicial claim to legislative, indeed super legislative power, a claim fundamentally at odds with our system of government. In fact, when you read his dissenting opinion, he was far from the usual ironic talk that the justices have when they dissent. He was very strong. In fact, there were 83 top-notch legal scholars, many of them teaching at massive um, public universities like Emory, like University of Michigan, that put out a decree five months later and declared that a Burger fellow is not the law of the land, and they called upon the other branches of the federal government and state governments to oppose the judiciary. They said, if you don't do it, it is the death knell of Western civilization. They actually put their entire careers on the line just to speak against a Burgerfell. So the second part of this fiction is that SCOTUS is the final arbiter of what is constitutional and what is unconstitutional. Ever hear that? Yeah, that's what they say. And what they tell you, the lawyers, your teacher, um, the magistrates, they'll tell you Article 6, Paragraph 2 of the U.S. Constitution declares that the Supreme Court has the supremacy over all 
constitutional matters. And they call it the Supremacy Clause. And it is the Supremacy Clause. But the problem is when you read Article 6, Paragraph 2, you happen to notice that SCOTUS is nowhere mentioned. In fact, you happen to notice that nowhere is the federal judiciary mentioned. In fact, you happen to notice that what has the supremacy is the Constitution itself. So the idea of judicial supremacy being found in the Supremacy Clause is a complete and utter lie. And you know what the very next paragraph is about after that? About how every magistrate from a policeman to the president takes an oath to uphold the Constitution. They don't take an oath of subservience to the federal government. They don't take an oath to uphold unjust or immoral court opinions issued by SCOTUS. No, they take an oath to uphold the Constitution and our founders wanted it that way. They did not want a final arbiter. They wanted this tension between the different branches of government and they pillared right within our founding institutions and documents the fact that one branch would check another. The reason they wanted this federalism, I'm talking about the federal government, I'm talking about federalism. In a federalism, you have multiple levels of government, multiple branches of, on each level, so that if any one branch or branches begins to play the tyrant, another branch or branches will check that branch, even if the branch playing the tyrant is the Supreme Court itself. Understand? They wanted it this way because they didn't want power to reside in one man, like the king they fought against, or in a small group of men, like an oligarchy, which the Supreme Court has become. They did not want it in one man's hand or a small group. They wanted this federalism because they had a biblical view of the nature of man that he's wicked and he's in need of a savior, namely Jesus Christ. That's why they pillared it this way. And that's why Thomas Jefferson, who spent the last 23 years of his life at war with the Supreme Court and the federal judiciary, he said to a, federal, to a judicial supremacist of his day, you seem to consider the judges as the ultimate arbiters of all constitutional questions, a very dangerous doctrine indeed, and one which would place us under the despotism of an oligarchy. He went on to say, oh, James Madison said, on the subject of an arbiter or umpire, there can be none external to the US federal government more than the individual states. They expected the states to interpose and defy when the federal government did wrong. Did you know in our state in 1854 in Wisconsin, a runaway slave was arrested and he was freed by a group of people who helped him get away? The federal government was mad, so they went after the guy they viewed as the ringleader. And it became a battle of jurisdictions where our legislature and our state Supreme Court defied the US Supreme Court and the entire federal government over the Federal Fugitive Slave Act. And it was never resolved, scholars say, because the Civil War ended up making it moot. It was a battle of jurisdictions all the way up. This is what our founders expected the states to do. They did not expect them to be mere provinces of the federal government. They did not expect them to be mere implementation centers of unjust and immoral federal law, policy, and court opinion. Do you understand? It's extremely important to teach these things. The third part of the great fiction is this. All other authorities in the nation must bow down to whatever SCOTUS issues. And that's a lie. By the way, all three of these things are found in the Supreme Court decision called Aaron in, 15, in 1958. What they ruled on was right, but what they said was wrong. Do you know why Thomas Jefferson spent the last 23 years at war with the Supreme Court and the federal judiciary? It was because he learned early on what they were doing. He learned that they were writing opinions in such a way that it granted powers to the federal government and to themselves not granted to them in the Constitution. That's why. In fact, there were over 20 cases in the first 35 years where SCOTUS wrote powers for themselves and the federal government not granted to themselves or the federal government in the Constitution itself. In fact, it only took six years after the ink dried on the, 
on the Constitution for the judiciary to do that. And our legislature responded with the 11th Amendment to our Constitution. And then 24 years later, pardon me, 26 years later, the federal judiciary and the Supreme Court trampled it again, trampled the 11th Amendment. Now here's an important point, right? At the beginning of our nation, the judiciary was viewed as the weakest of the three branches. They actually met in the basement of the Capitol building. All of the founders talked about how they were the weakest. Alexander Hamilton said, the judiciary from the nature of its functions will always be the least dangerous to the political rights of the Constitution because it will be least in the capacity to annoy or injure them. You know why he said they're the least in the capacity to annoy or injure them? Because they have no policing power. The only way a Supreme Court opinion becomes anything in your state is because your governor doesn't do his duty and uphold your state constitution and your state statutes, and he gets up in front of a podium and says, same-sex marriage is now the law of the land here in Pennsylvania. That's what our great conservative governor, Scott Walker, did as soon as the Burgerfell was passed. Walked up to the podium, couldn't get to a mic fast enough, and said, same-sex marriage is now the law of the land in Wisconsin. The only way it has any bearing on the state is because your authorities here in your state give it to them. You do understand the Supreme Court and the federal judiciary have been the dispensers of immorality and injustice in this nation for decades. What wicked men weren't able to get through representative government, they've gotten through raw judicial power because of this matter of SCOTUS being viewed as the ultimate arbiter. So Alexander Hamilton said they're the least dangerous. Madison, remember that he's the architect, said the judiciary is beyond comparison the weakest of the three departments of power. He went on to say in Republican government the legislative authority necessarily predominates. Thomas Jefferson said at the establishment of our constitutions, the judiciary bodies were supposed to be the most helpless and harmless members of the government. Experience, however, soon showed in what way they would become the most dangerous. And like I said, they did it through writing opinions, giving themselves and the federal government power not granted to them in the Constitution itself. So all these guys say they're the least dangerous, the weakest, the most helpless, the most harmless. And that's all been turned on its head, where now all the other branches of government bow down to SCOTUS and do whatever they say. And have you noticed? Have you ever been when they release one of their opinions, an important one? I have. Out there in Washington, D.C., thousands of people, more phalanx of media than you could ever imagine, hundreds and hundreds of them, all gathered to wait to hear the oracle speak so it can tell them how to think and how to live. If our founding fathers saw that, they would weep. They never intended any such a thing. And the Supreme Court justices themselves are arrogant. Look what Charles Evan Hughes, Supreme Court justice, said in 1907. He said, we are under a constitution, but the constitution is what the Supreme Court says it is. Listen, whenever you give any human institution unlimited, unchecked power, it will corrupt itself. And that is why our founders would have found the idea that the Supreme Court had unchecked, unlimited power to be intolerable. Here's what Harlan Stone, who was appointed by a Republican president and then made chief justice by a Democrat president, he said, the only check upon our own exercise of power is our own self-restraint. You see the hubris here? The arrogance that you develop when you have unchecked power? Here's what Richard Posner said. He just retired in 2017. He was placed on the federal bench by Ronald Reagan himself back in 1982. He said this in a speech in 2015, it's funny to talk about the oath judges take to uphold the Constitution since the Supreme Court has transformed the Constitution in its decisions. The oath is not really to the original Constitution or to the Constitution as amended. 
It is to some body of law created by the Supreme Court. You can forget about the oath. That is not of significance. Understand when you read his speech, he's not chiding this. He's applauding it. It's a problem on both sides of the aisle. And they use judicial supremacy to keep you on their little hamster wheel. How many years have people voted for the Republican president because they get to a place, the Supreme Court justice is there? Did you know that when Roe was decided, six of the nine justices at that time were Republican appointed? And did you know for the next 35 years after 1973, the Republicans had the majority, with many changes being made while there were Republican presidents, they always had the majority either seven to two or eight to one, and yet we still have, the blood, we still have this bloodshed going on. They have used it, used the suffering of the preborn as a political football for their own ends, and we've allowed it. Alpheus Thomas Mason, he's alive, he's a legal historian. He said implicit in the system of government the framers designed is the basic premise that unchecked power in any hands whatsoever is intolerable. Jefferson said the germ of dissolution of our federal government is in the constitution of the federal judiciary. An irresponsible body for impeachment is scarcely a scarecrow. Don't waste your time trying to impeach them. And that's an interesting historical read about impeachments. Working like gravity by night and by day, he says, gaining a little today and a little tomorrow and advancing its noiseless step like a thief over the field of jurisdiction until all shall be usurped. We've long been there. Everybody does what they say. And they dispense the evil. They dispense the immorality. They dispense the injustice. And everyone complies. Roe may go down at the end of this month. But history will always remember that we sat here for 49 years waiting for the court. Some people think we can hide behind what the Supreme Court did and be innocent of all the innocent blood that's been shed. What they're going to learn is the people will vote to murder their own sons and daughters. Their legislators and their governors will make sure the murder continues. Mark my words. The guilt was already, the blood guilt, was already upon us and our nation. And understand this too. The filth of Sodom continues with no interposition by the lesser authorities. Every Republican I know says you don't touch that issue with a 10-foot pole. Leave that alone. I'm not kidding you. Understand also it only is we are only one court opinion away from the government telling us to put a shot in our arms that we don't want or shots in our children that we don't want them to have. One court pinning away if people continue this blithe compliance with the federal judiciary and the Supreme Court. You must dismantle this from them. You have to expose the lie in the fiction. And then you'll see interposition more readily happen. Here's what pro-lifers did for five decades. They went back to the tyrant with hat in hand, begging for some scraps off the table, asking them to undo Roe when they could have just went around the whole thing and interposed for the pre-born. They could have stopped the slaughter in 1973. Do you know that Roe has been before the Supreme Court 38 times before this? And they upheld Roe every time, 38 times. And that's not counting the hundreds of times bills were brought and were killed in the federal judiciary that never made it to the Supreme Court. And yet, who also proffered the lie? The pro-life and pro-family groups. It's one thing to be ignorant. It's another thing to be told the truth. And I told this truth to many of them, and they would still continue and tell people, no, we have to undo Roe in order to protect the preborn. That's a lie. We didn't have to undo Roe. We needed a governor and a legislature who would simply not be cowards and do their duty and interpose against the evil of the murder that was taking place in the land. He looks for a man to stand in the gap, and he's found none. 
Therefore, he brings his judgment upon the land. We are not going to escape the blood guilt that's on us and our nation by a Friday night rally and a cup of latte. It isn't going to happen. I'm going to skip this. That's a great quote by William Blackstone regarding murder. Thomas Jefferson, he was like prescient about all this stuff. He said, if those who administer the general government, talking about the federal government, be permitted to transgress the limits fixed by the compact, talking about the Constitution, by a total disregard to the special delegations of power therein contained, annihilation of the state governments and the erection upon their ruins of a general consolidation government will be the inevitable consequence. We've long been there. The states have been reduced to mere provinces, and the federal master has been smart about how he pulled it off. He did it through the purse. He buys the lesser authorities off so they do his bidding rather than do what's right in the sight of Christ and neighbor. I'll pass this up too. I already talked about those things. Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Find out just what any people will quietly submit to and you have found the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. When they're imposing all these things, these mandates and edicts, masking, shots, and all the other nonsense, understand what's happening. As long as you think you're going to appease them by going along, have you learned you're not going to appease them? You can't. They'll keep going as long as you keep submitting. James Madison, the architect, said, the powers delegated by the proposed constitution of the federal government are few and defined. Those which are to remain in state governments are numerous and indefinite. That's all been turned on its head. James Madison, and I end with this, he said, the preservation of a free government requires not merely that the meets and bounds which separate each department of power may be invariably maintained, but more especially that neither of them be suffered to overleap the great barrier which defends the rights of the people. The rulers who are guilty of such an encroachment exceed the commission from which they derive their authority and are tyrants. The people who submit to it are governed by laws made neither by themselves nor by an authority derived from them and are slaves. That's what we are. And now let's go to questions. Okay. okay, so we're gonna open it up a little bit for questions. Try to be concise with your questions. Refrain from comments in general, just questions for these guys. Um, me and our, our elder Ron will be going around, so I saw firsthand. So we'll just do a handful of questions just to respect your dinner time, so uh, go ahead. By the way, I only prefer uh, stupid questions and hard questions. <laughs> um. First, I just want to say thank you very much for coming. Um, but I guess my question is, I was just quickly Googling uh, the case that you mes mentioned about the judicial supremacy. And with um, the Cooper versus Aaron case, what do you think should be done when states aren't getting it right? Sure. Yeah, I have a, <clears throat> is this on? I have a chapter in my book when the lesser authorities go rogue. <laughs> so I talk about the fact that their peers, those who are on the same level with them, have a duty to interpose against them, that their subordinates have a duty to interpose against them, and that the superior authority has a duty to interpose against them, because they can do that. And so we did see that, um, you know, with the states and the counties, their subordinates standing in interposition against them. And, uh, of course, the federal government didn't because they were encouraging them to play the tyrant. But, yeah, when the lesser authorities act evilly, then it's the duty of the other ones to intervene against the evil that they're doing. Here's something that happened that I mentioned in my book, is that before same-sex marriage was ruled on by the Supreme Court, way back in 2005, California, uh, pardon me, San Francisco, San Francisco started marrying homosexual couples. 
And that's under, that was done under the present governor of California, Gavin Newsom, okay? So my daughter and my son-in-law were living in California at the time, Southern California, and they were bothered by what was going on. And they happened to call me up just after we got done with a prayer meeting at our church and said, what should we do? And I said, Jason, get together as many young men as you can, drive to San Francisco, walk to the front of the line and sit down and interpose against the evil that's being done, wipe the shame off Christ's face for what's going on there. And I said, you watch, I guarantee you, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who was the governor at the time, will immediately come out and end all of these marriages that are taking place. That has had been going on for over two weeks at this point. It was a national news story. He gathered together 12 young men and two women, including his wife, my daughter. They drove through the night up to San Francisco. When they got there, it was daytime. There were so many homosexuals flying in from all over the place that they came um, out the building after going through many hallways and around the block. So they walked past all of them, through the, all the hallways, went all the way to the thing, and then placed themselves because they had three different officials in there marrying the homosexual couples right in the doorway. And they began to just worship God. Well, the sheriff came in with the deputies and um, tried to get them to move. They wouldn't move. So they finally arrested them and dragged them out of the building. When I watched the news that night, ABC National News, back when TV was something, um, it was the top story. And there was my son-in-law and my daughter on national news. And guess what happened the next day? Arnold Schwarzenegger came out. He didn't make a righteous pronouncement and say this is evil and shouldn't be happening. What he said was, we have to stop this because now we have both sides and we could have violence. <laughs> so, but I knew he would end it all, and he did. So as the superior authority, he came in and ended what was happening. That's what, how it's supposed to work. And, and if you've been paying attention, you probably noticed a little disconnect between our two messages. I'm like, I'm all about we the people, and he's like all about the lesser magistrates. And you're probably like, well, wait a minute, how does that go together? I completely agree with everything he's saying. We are, we are, we, we are to have an ordained order. Romans 13 is clear about that. It talks about there is governing authorities. But I'm here to tell you, all the stuff he recommended, I think he would agree with me, he knows where I'm going with this, they're going to ignore you. They're going to say no to you. They're going to laugh at you. They're going to shut the door in your face. All the stuff he said to do, do it. Go do those four things he said. And be ready for when they close the door in your face and ignore you to be able to escalate it. That's what we're here for. Because we, the people, are there to hold the magistrates accountable through influence with the community. And so they're, you're, you go talk to your school board to get the pornography out of it, they're just going to sit there stoically and ignore you. You go talk to the to the county commissioner, and they're gonna try and bump you out six months from now when they're available. And then they're still gonna ignore you. They're all going to ignore you. What matters is, is do you have the ability to rally a community behind you as the body of Christ being influential salt and light, making the moral argument so that they can no longer ignore you. His is about the doctrine of lesser magistrates. We're about how to hit the nerve of the lesser magistrates. Right. And they don't all ignore you. Um, most of them ignore you. <laughs> there was over, there's over 3,000 counties in America, and we did see interposition by over 400 counties against all the evil that was being done. Um, and the exercise. Exactly. So, and the role of the people in the doctrine of the lesser magistrate is massively important. It's one of the tenets of the doctrine. The role the people play is important, like Rick is saying. The duty of us as the people is to prod our magistrates to do right. Most men aren't like Judge Roy Moore and won't just do it because they know it's the right thing to do. Most have to be prodded to act and to do what's right. And when you meet with them and call upon them to interpose, you have to remind them that you will stand with them four square with your property, with your person, with your prayers, both publicly and privately. The role you play is huge to the Doctrine of Lesser Magistrate, and it's huge to seeing good government restored in our nation 
and that's what Rick's trying to get accomplished with getting people involved at the county, local, and state level. Any other questions? I've got the mic over here. Uh, Rick Crump, for yep. you, I, part of what I do is I teach Bible clubs in schools during the school years in the public school system. So I had a question. I wanted to know which schools or school was it in that you mentioned that you put it into the transgender bathroom issue between the attack on boys and girls room? Yeah, it was Eastern Lancaster County, known as the Elanco. Okay. Probably one of the most conservative school districts you'll ever find. Deliberately had a move to family in. The family only moved in about a year before this started, by coincidence, right? It's the typical scenario where the female is going to go into the boys' bathroom. Everyone's going to ignore that because if they started with a boy going to the girls' bathroom, it's through the hornet's nest, right? They, know how, they just know how to play it, right? School group tried to, tried to ignore it. Parents got up in arms, weren't getting anywhere, brought us in, we organized them. To this day, those boys and girls bathrooms still stand. They tried to destroy them over the summer, stirred the bees, uh, the bees nest even further. To this day, those bathrooms still stand. I know this is a big question, so I'll just kind of throw it out there and, uh, uh, and uh, give you the, uh, you know, wherever you want to go with it. Sure. But everything that you talked about, how would you connect that to ecclesiology, whether that be in the context of uh, churches that would simply say, well, that's just a political thing or a government thing, or in a context where a church is not in America, and they would say, well, we don't have that structure. We don't have everything that you talked about. Um, we're just simply trying to be a church. So I guess, you know, how would you kind of, what sure. biblical passages or principles would connect that? Yeah, I would say they have a wrong view of what the church is. If they're saying we shouldn't be involved in any of those things and we just want to be a church, then they're not being a church because God's word speaks to all matters of our life and all matters of life. And we as his ambassadors, as his people, have a duty to bring his law and gospel to men, including the governments of men. And this has been the whole history of Christianity. You look at the prophets of old. Micah, for example, went to the capital of the northern kingdom, Samaria, went to Jerusalem in the southern kingdom. Why? Because of the fact that that's where the evil takes place. That's where the businessmen and the magistrates were working together to impose evil on the land. When you look at the book of Acts, I preached through there two years ago. I preached through Micah four years ago. You should listen to my sermons on those. You can go to sermonaudio.com, put my name in. You can listen to my sermons on Micah. I preach, I preach expositionally. I went all through Micah. I went all through Acts. The book of Acts was written to a Roman magistrate, Theophilus. The first convert Paul had in his first missionary journey was a Roman magistrate. They had countless encounters with the magistrates. Paul spent the last few years of his life chained to a Roman magistrate. And when you move on from there, you see that the apologists of old, starting in 140 AD, they wrote their apologies to the emperor, to the governor, to some Roman official, and then to the people teaching them about Christ, his great salvation, and also teaching them Christian thought and how Chris, what Christianity actually believes. You look at the early missionaries, they would go to the civil authorities often. Columba did it with the Picts and the Scots. Patrick did it with the Irish. Boniface did it with the Germanic peoples. They went to the civil authorities to ask for permission well, they wanted to win them to Christ first and foremost, but at least get permission to be able to preach the gospel in their realm. And they did that because they quoted Psalm chapter 2. They saw that God's um, kingdom is not just for us as individuals, but for nations. And so they would quote, quote Romans, um, pardon me, Psalm chapter 2 to the civil authorities. They understood that they were to address them and not just individuals trying to get them, you know, to say a sinner's prayer. Um, so you go on from there, you look at the churchmen. There was Gregory back in the fourth century. He was instrumental in winning King Tiridates to the gospel. Armenia became the first nation to embrace the gospel anywhere in the world. 
Gregory spent 12 years in prison, suffering under the hands of the king, and then won the king to Christ subsequent to that. Um, you look at Alfred the Great um, in the ninth century. He walked around with the law of God in his pocket. He surrounded himself with churchmen, the foremost of which was a churchman named Asser, who taught him from the word of God regarding Christian thought for his office, for society at large. Um, you look at Nicholas von Amsdorf and the reformers, how Nicholas von Amsdorf, who's the first signer of the Magdeburg Confession, he was placed in the pulpit in Magdeburg in 1524. In 1524, Magdeburg became the first city to embrace the Reformation. And Luther thought so highly of Nicholas von Amsdorf that he placed him in the pulpit there. Luther said, we took the city without firing a shot, just by being faithful to the word and gospel. So when you look at the churchmen of old, they understood that they had a duty to engage the magistrates and instruct them in their office from the word of God regarding their role, their functions, their duties, and their limits. That's extremely important to understand. And I could add a million things, but let me say this. All of Christianity, the history of it, has always understood the importance of us as churchmen and Christians in bringing Christian thought to bear upon civil government matters. That's all changed over the last few hundred years. It started with a thing called pietism, which started in the late 17th century, where certain churchmen felt that they saw Christianity in the public realm, but they saw virtually none of it in the private realm. I don't agree with their assessment because I read many of the Puritans during that time. Christ was alive in the hearts of many men at that time. But that was their perception. But what happened is the kings and emperors that day, they liked this new form of Christianity being pushed, which just kept it to yourself. Narcissistic, all inward, like, you know, Christianity has that through the roof at this point. The reason they liked it is because they wanted to push the churchmen from speaking about civil government matters out of the picture so that they could rule without their hindrance. So they actually put the pietists in positions of um, prominence within the universities of their day. So here's where we've ended up now. All of Christianity, pietism started with the, with the Lutherans, moved in amongst the reformed men, went on from there to the Baptists. Every form of Christianity is pietism now. Every form. And, and it's been a bane to Western civilization. So now everything's been turned on its head where churchmen teach Christian people that they're spiritual for being indifferent towards civil government matters. And because of that, we've abandoned the realm of civil government. We've abandoned the magistrates. It's the great failure of our age as the church. And since we've abandoned the civil government realm under the guise of that's unspiritual, we won't taint ourselves with that, wicked men have filled the void and they've made their law, policy, and court opinion the law of the land. They've made their worldview law, policy, and court opinion. You can see it's not good. And what's damaging is, and I have lectures, if you go to our website, defytyrants.com, I have short articles about pietism. I also have a lecture there about it and a short two-minute video also. Um, the churchmen have pillared, and I learned this early on when I got involved in my efforts for the preborn. They would always come up with these little slogans to try to make me feel bad and like I'm a dope for being involved in civil government matters. And they have these slogans like, we should just preach the gospel. We should just pray. Um, we should just expect sinners to act like sinners. God's in control. They actually invoke the sovereignty of God to justify their indifference to evil. So anyways, let me just answer the first one, because you have to be able to dismantle these slogans, because they're meant to shame you, to make you feel unspiritual, to put a wet blanket over you so you get out of civil government matters and get back onto the religious hamster wheel to nowhere, where you study the Bible 15,000 times but never apply it. That's why I love John Knox. He applied the law and word of God to every area of life. He's a hero in our home. 
So when they say that we should just preach the gospel, here's how I respond. First off, no one just preaches the gospel. Do you ever go for a walk with your wife? Do you ever wrestle with your children? Do you ever use the restroom? No one just preaches the gospel. And did you notice when they say we should just preach the gospel, you listen. Next time the church potluck is announced, see if somebody stands up and says, oh no, we should just preach the gospel. Or when the church softball team is being organized, see if someone says, oh no, we should just preach the gospel. It's only when you bring up a civil government matter, helping the pre-born, defending marriage, helping someone get elected, or whatever it is, saying it's the evil and tyranny. There's a boundless evils and idols and, and tyrants in our age. The church always confronted them, didn't act indifferent to them, ended up in confrontation with them. There's a great work that everyone should read called Idols for Destruction by Herbert Schlossberg. It's a phenomenal work. So look, when they tell you this thing, you should just preach the gospel. It's meant to shame you, belittle you, put a wet blanket over you. And the third thing I say is this. Where are all these people just preaching the gospel? Because I like never run into them. I think I found like four tracks in my lifetime laying somewhere. I never see anyone out publicly preaching unless it's me or somebody I know. And what is going on with that? So you have to dismantle these things because it's all bad ecclesiology. When they think that Christ has nothing to say about a certain area of life. And the churchmen always spoke about this, whether you read Machen um, or other men down through the ages, they address this matter of how the church must confront the evil in the land, not retreat from it and hide behind spiritual platitudes. So anyway, I went way too long, I know, but just, thank you. Just a thank real you. quick uh, couple points. Um, something you said earlier made me think of this. Be prepared for the accusation of Christian nationalism if you haven't already heard the phrase. The left is always on offense. And you know why? Because they know they can put us on our heels because we're not even used to playing defense. We're trying to change that. But you're going to get the accusation, Christian nationalism, it's meant to, like you said, scare you back into your rabbit hole, make you defend yourself, sit down and shut up because you don't want to deal. It's easily dismantled. This isn't about... This isn't about bringing the kingdom of God through America. I could be in Brazil, Peru, Uruguay, far China, I'd still be preaching the same message. Because what we're talking about here is moral issues that do end up executing themselves through human institutions, like elections and stuff, but they're all moral issues, so it's not about Christian nationalism. Here's the beautiful part, though. In America, you don't have to actually go institute and this moral standard and these systems, you just have to defend it. Somebody else did all the heavy lifting for us over 200 years ago. So when they want to talk about, uh, accuse you of Christian nationalism, just remind them, this has nothing to do with the USA. Although it is convenient that somebody else did the heavy lifting for me and all we have to do is defend it. Okay, one more question, Luke. Uh, given that the law of the Lord is perfect, is the Constitution a foundation of stone or a foundation of sand? Okay, so I'm like the most least philosophical person on the planet, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> so, um, so there's a distinct difference between the Constitution and the word or the law of God. And I always tell people if the Constitution itself codified evil, or impugn the law or word of God in some way, then we should obey God rather than man. God's law is above all. It is the higher law to which all men and governments of men must be accountable. What do I think of it as a document? I think the document was made from, I've read countless things, and what they were wanting to do was give very few things to a general government to accomplish. There were men who were worried about that, as you know, called the anti-constitutionalists in our day, Patrick Henry being one of them. And um, they kind of turned out to be right. But still, I think the Constitution is a great document for what it was meant to do. Here's what people will say to me. They say to me, Pastor Matt, what's the best form of government? And I always respond and say, there is no best form. 
I say there's some forms that are better than others, but there's no best form because man, being what he is, can corrupt any form of government, including a constitutional representative republic. We've seen it with our own eyes in our day. And so I believe it's um, a good document that we can still refer back to. It is one of the four organic laws of our nation, and we can appeal to it to rein in the tyranny of the evil that's being done in the land. I hope that helps. Yeah, let me add to that. That's a great example though, of what I was just talking about, that somebody else did all the heavy lifting, and we just have to defend what's good in it and try to change what, what we think may be contrary to God's word. And so you hear me talk about the moral argument, the moral argument, the moral argument. Let me give you an example of the moral argument because when Matt's up here talking about the, the masks being an overstepping of government and the, and the vaccines being an overstepping of government, what's important is that you can explain to somebody the moral argument for why it's wrong and why it's tyranny. So to use your example of the Constitution, we have three criteria that we made a video about. The first was, if, a, if any rule or law or order is, is disobeying God's law, first and foremost, then it's null and void. And then secondly, if it passed that test and it's violating the U.S. Constitution, it's null and void. And then if it passes that test and that test, but, it pa but, it, but you're out of your jurisdiction, it's null and void. And by the way, if you violate the first two, you've automatically violated the third one. But let me give you an example. The moral argument for why it was tyranny for masking and distancing was because in God's law, there is a presumption of innocence. Mm -hmm. And that went to, that was in effect also when it came to quarantining people who were sick. The burden of proof has always been on the state to prove that you were a threat to others. COVID changed all that. The presumption was that you're now a threat unless you can prove your innocence. And by the way, the only way you can prove your innocence is through compliance up to the point of getting the jab. So it already violated God's ordained law. Then it violated the Constitution, obviously the First Amendment, with the freedom of assembly and the freedom of religion. Okay, it violated the Tenth Amendment in many cases where the federal government was trying to overstep its bounds. And so we can make this moral argument that the government is being tyrannical because of these standards that we have in God's law and because of how we are good citizens with the Constitution where it makes sense. And then, of course, if you're violating those first two, you've automatically violated jurisdiction. Most, most people can't make the moral argument, which is why people look at us and think we're just being defiant. You see? That's why we got to get our, our heads wrapped around the moral argument. Okay, so Rick, you're going to finish this up with a couple yeah. of things? Yeah, so um, I'd like to end with uh, two final polling questions, be honest. Okay. This last question. For those of you who do not attend this church, because obviously your church has been very open, we thank you very much for opening your doors to us. We're very, very grateful. Pastor Matt Kennenser, you guys have a great pastor for those of you who attend here, and I encourage you to support this man and everything you do. For those, for those of you, yes, thank you. So thank you to his team back there that helped us tonight too. So for those of you who do not attend this church, how open is your church's leadership, pastors and elders, to the message you heard tonight? How open do you think that they would be to this? Be honest. I think we're identifying your first mission field. Interposition. For those of you who, I, who said A through C, Based on what Matt and I said tonight, you now know what you're supposed to do. You know now where your mission field is. For those of you who answered D, let's talk. Let's get the appointment. Let's have a 15-minute conversation. Guys, we've got to get the church off the bench. If my people will humble themselves. I looked for a man to stand in the gap and found none. It's all about us. It rises and falls with us. All right. Last question for tonight. That's what he says. So anticlimactic. <laughs> What's the one word you would use to describe your state of mind now leaving this event? Just one word. I'm going to ask my team, if you would, Nicole and Justin, please pass out the papers.
We're gonna ask you guys to take this paper. You can throw it away, take it home and think about it, you can fill it out tonight. But we're gonna give you the paper because we want you to make a decision, all right? And basically this paper is going to just basically put you in the position of saying, I wanna go further or I don't. And by the way, it doesn't have to be with kinetic faith. This is, this is offering what kinetic faith can do for you. But if there's somebody else out there, we have yet to find anybody else like us, quite frankly. And I am hoping and praying that somebody else arises because I'm sick and tired of getting my head kicked in by myself. But what we want you to do is we want you to prayerfully consider this. We want to come up beside you. We want to yoke with you. We're trying to get these conferences across the United States to go after abortion. We need your help. We need the financial support. We need to get into the churches to get our message out. We need to get more congregants aware of their, their responsibilities. Guys, I'm gonna make a bold statement here. This is kind of like evangelism. If you don't tell people about their need for Christ, they're eternally separated from God, right? If you don't tell Christians about their responsibility for in, in position, and in interposition, they're going to stand before God in judgment for it. We all have a responsibility to make sure that our brothers and sisters in Christ are walking accordingly. Hebrews 10, 24, therefore let us provoke each, uh, provoke each other to love and good deeds. That, that word provoke or stimulate, that Greek word means to irritate. Does it, and all the new translations are using words like support and encourage and motivate because they're flowery sounding words. But when that word was written, it was written because the, the author knew the sin nature of even Christians, that we got to be pushed out of our comfort zones. Amen? We got to be pushed out of our comfort zones if we're going to have any chance whatsoever of being salt and light out there and getting those people out of their comfort zones. So please consider that. I thank you for listening tonight. God bless you.